Spartan warriors stand along the shores of Greece, taunting the Athenian troops aboard their naval ships. Athens controls the water, but the fierce and deadly Spartan army continues to dominate on land. Blood is spilled across Greece as the Peloponnesian War rages on. Spies and assassins stalk the streets of every major city. A plague runs rampant through urban centers, decimating populations. And in the end, Sparta will turn to Greece's most hated enemy for help. But will it be enough? The year is 550 BCE. Sparta, Corinth, Elis, and Teia form an alliance, the likes of which has never been seen in Greece. The group of city-states calls themselves the Peloponnesian League. They control much of southern Greece, including the Peloponnese region, where the League takes its name from. The leadership has an understanding that they'll work together to oppose any outside aggressors trying to infiltrate their territory. The alliances between the members of the League are tentative at best, and more of a convenience than anything else. However, in the years to come, the members of the Peloponnesian League will band together to combat a growing threat arising just outside their borders. Sparta is the de facto leader of the League and uses it to quell uprisings that arise within their territory. The warriors are known around the ancient world for their precision and deadly tactics. Myths and epics have been written about their exploits, most famous of which is the Battle of Thermopylae, where Leonidas and his 300 Spartan warriors gave their lives to slow the onslaught of Persian soldiers invading Greece allowing the rest of the city-states to gather their forces and mount a successful defense. In 478 BCE, one of the greatest threats to Sparta's dominance arises. It's during this time that the Dalian League begins to take shape. Athens sets out with its powerful navy to free eastern Greek cities from Persian rule. Once liberated, the territories and isles across the Aegean ally themselves with Athens, and the Dalian League becomes a major power in the region. Athens secures several more victories in Marathon, Salamis and Plataea, the city-states band together to protect one another from any future Persian aggression. The Dalian League continues to grow in size and strength. Over 300 cities are now under the control of Athens, with huge amounts of tribute coming in from the territories that they liberated and an increased pool of soldiers to pull from, Athens becomes as powerful if not more powerful than Sparta. It looks to expand its empire and influence across Greece. Athens requires all members of the Dalian League to provide tribute in the form of money, ships, and men. It utilizes these vast resources to stand up to Sparta and the Peloponnesian League. In the coming years, a series of small conflicts will ignite an all-out war between the two powers, and only one can come out victorious. Just prior to 460 BCE, two Peloponnesian League city-states find themselves at odds with one another. A dispute between Megara and Corinth has escalated. Sparta has closer ties to Corinth and offers assistance, but Athens takes note of the internal conflict within the Peloponnesian League and decides to use it to their advantage. The leaders of Athens begin backing Megara in an attempt to sway the city into joining the Delian League, or at the very least weaken Sparta's hold on the area. Megara forms closer ties with Athens, and this development does not go unnoticed by the Spartans. The Athenians have been expanding their sphere of influence, and now they're claiming Spartan territory as their own. And those spies that are lurking in the Athenian cities soon become a big problem. That's right, even in ancient times, there were bad actors probing and prodding into private domains. Today, we face a different kind of intrusion, but it's just as unsettling. Have you ever Googled yourself and were shocked to see your personal information exposed on those public listing sites? Data brokers are making a fortune selling your information to robocallers, spammers, and others who want to learn more about you, like where you live. That's why I'm excited to tell you about today's sponsor, Aura. Aura can identify data brokers exposing your info and submit opt-out requests on your behalf. Brokers are legally required to remove your info if you ask them to, but they make it super hard to do. Let Aura handle it for you. You can try Aura free for two weeks using my link. Aura also does so much more to protect you and your family from online threats you can't see. It's really easy to set up, so you don't have to download several different apps to get things like parental controls, antivirus, VPN, password management, identity theft insurance, and more. You get everything at one affordable price. Let Aura do the hard work of keeping you safe online, so you can focus on other tasks with peace of mind. You can either let people continue to exploit and profit off your private information, or you can go to Aura.com infographics to start your two-week free trial, also linked below in the description. But back to ancient Sparta, where unfortunately for the Athenians, they didn't have anyone to protect their data and spies and informants report back to the Spartan leadership that Athens has been pouring resources into improving their naval capabilities. Soon their naval might might be unmatched by any other in the region, but it's one construction project in particular that catches Sparta's eye. If completed, it could make Athens siege-proof. 
the Athenians are constructing their long walls between Athens and the ports of Piraeus and Phaleron. The Athenians know their navy is formidable, and it's highly unlikely that any of their adversaries will successfully be able to blockade their ports. This means that even if a hostile army is outside the walls of the city, Athens will still be able to receive supplies from Piraeus and Phaleron via the long walls. The construction and refurbishment of these structures signal to the Spartans that Athens is getting ready for war in the near future. In 460 BCE, the Athenians are close enough to Corinth's borders that the city-state can no longer ignore the Dalian League threat. A series of battles break out between Corinth and Athens, marking the beginning of the First Peloponnesian War. As a result, several members of the Peloponnesian League sent troops to aid Corinth. Sparta remains out of the conflict for the most part. The Corinthian warriors and their allies repel Athenian attacks and eventually push them out of their territory. However, while the Athenian army is not faring so well on land, their navy continues to grow in strength and size. The Athenians control the seas, launching several campaigns to claim islands and coastal towns around the Aegean. They even send part of their fleet to Egypt in order to increase their influence in the area. Over the next decade, a series of battles are fought around Greece as members of the Peloponnesian League and the Dalian League try to expand their borders. Even though Sparta has been offering minimal support thus far, Athenian forces are encroaching on Spartan-controlled territories. Sparta ramps up its involvement in the conflict and begins to dominate the land battles across Greece. In 457, they defeat Athenian forces at Tanagra. Both sides take heavy losses, and the decisive Spartan victory results in both armies returning home rather than continuing on their campaign. While there's a break in the fighting, Athens approaches Argos, one of the main threats to Sparta's dominance over the Peloponnesian League. This is cause for alarm and puts the Spartan leadership on high alert. While Sparta keeps an eye on Argos and the Dalian League as a whole, the Athenian navy launches a series of campaigns to attack the coastal regions of the Peloponnese. But Athens has stretched their forces too thin. Their ships and soldiers in Egypt are crushed by the Persian army. In 454, the treasury of the Dalian League moves to Athens, solidifying the city's dominance. This allows Athens to control the finances of the League and pour money into their own campaigns. Following their defeat in Egypt and the restructuring of the Dalian League, Athens reduces the number of campaigns it launches into Peloponnesian League territory. In order to give Athens time to finalize its plans for an empire, they seek a truce with Sparta. In 446 BCE, the Thirty Years' Peace Treaty is established between Athens and Sparta. Unfortunately, that peace will only last a fraction of that time. Just over ten years after the peace treaty is signed, Athens takes the first step toward resuming hostilities. Athens has gathered its strength and enacted strict tributary policies on other members of the Dalian League and their territories. Athens continues to grow its army and navy, all the while Sparta keeps watch on the growing threat in the northeast. In 433, Athens forges an alliance with Corsaira, one of Corinth's most important colonies. Athens sends forces to Corsaira while fighting breaks out between Athenian and Corinthian forces. The following year in 432 BCE, Sparta and its allies in the Peloponnesian League accuse Athens of breaking the Thirty Years' Treaty and begin to prepare for war. Athens once again oversteps the agreed-upon parameters of the peace treaty when they demand the territory of Potidaea remove all fortifications so that trade vessels can more easily deliver timber and minerals from Thrace to Athens and the rest of the Dalian League. Rather than submit to Athenian threats, Potidaea asks Sparta for protection. The leaders of Sparta agree to aid and protect Potidaea. Athens knows Potidaea is under the protection of the Peloponnesian League, yet they still lay siege to the city. Athens then issues the Megarian Decrees, which prevent Megara from using any Dalian League ports. This creates a de facto embargo on Megara in hopes of weakening the city and forcing them into an alliance with Athens. Since Megara is still part of the Peloponnesian League, Sparta takes great offense. It seems as if Athens will stop at nothing to claim all of Greece as their own. Spartan leadership understands that their own power is being brought into question, and Athens needs to be stopped at all costs. Sparta then asks Athens to repeal the Megarian decrees and return the region to the previous status quo. Athens refuses. Sparta is not ready to fight a prolonged war, but it will be soon, and at this point, they will make Athens pay for their insolence. The following year, Sparta and its allies gather a large enough force to oppose Athens. They're ready for war, and even though the peace is supposed to last for 30 years, Athens can no longer be allowed to do whatever it wants without consequence. Thebes, an ally of Sparta, launches an attack on Plataea a city controlled by the Delian League. The Spartan king Archidamos then leads an invasion of Attica, and the Second Peloponnesian War officially begins. Sparta realizes they should never have stayed out of the First Peloponnesian War as long as they did, but they will not make that mistake again. 
the full might of the Peloponnesian League advances toward Athens and its allies. A more deadly form of warfare begins to arise during the Second Peloponnesian War, as this will be the conflict that decides who will control Greece. Up to this point, Greek warfare mainly consisted of hoplite units operating in a phalanx formation. They operate in tightly packed lines, protecting one another with their shields as they lash out with spears and swords. However, this strategy is about to become obsolete, as combined arms tactics begin to take hold on the battlefield. Hoplites are now being mixed with light infantry and cavalry units to allow for more dynamic maneuvers and flanking strategies that result in entire enemy battalions being decimated. In order to meet the demands and numbers that the two major armies require, slaves, mercenaries, and foreign soldiers are required to fill out their ranks. However, the fact that these men are not as well trained and were not bred for battle means that casualty rates skyrocket. As more and more untrained soldiers are recruited, military leaders focus on honing their strategies to defeat their enemies. Spartan knows it has superior tactics and warriors on land, while Athens is aware that its navy is capable of annihilating enemy forces on the seas and hitting coastal cities hard. This division of power means that neither military will be able to defeat the other quickly. Every time the Spartans claim a land victory, the Athenians punish them with a coastal raid or the sinking of a Peloponnesian fleet. The war rages on as both sides sustain heavy losses. Like clockwork, Sparta and their allies attack the Delian League cities each year as they push toward Athens. This is done to create as much damage and chaos as possible. These annual campaigns leave a trail of devastation and death in their wake. The Peloponnesian League soldiers burn entire fields and crops, knock down their fortifications, and create disruptions to the Athenian supply chain. However, since Athens can still obtain goods, resources, and men by water, thanks to their superior navy, these annual raids seem to have a little effect. But the Spartan leadership continues their attacks for another reason. They are hoping to entice Athenian troops out from behind their great walls. Sparta knows that if the two armies go head-to-head -head in an epic battle on open terrain, the Spartan warriors will almost certainly come out victorious. However, Athenian leaders such as Pericles also know this, and when Sparta invades, it's decided the best thing for Athens and its allies to do is hide behind their fortifications. Unfortunately for the Athenians, death gets inside their walls anyway. It's not the form of an enemy raid or a complex spy network, but instead a microbe hidden within the food and goods delivered from the city of faraway lands. In 430 BCE, the plague reaches Athens. Since the population is confined behind their city walls, the disease spreads like wildfire. It becomes so bad that the Spartans postpone their annual invasion to reduce the risk of their warriors being exposed to the diseases. Athens begs for peace while they try to get the epidemic ravaging their city under control. Some believe the Spartans have poisoned the water supplies. Others accuse traders from Egypt and Africa of carrying the plague aboard their ships. The Spartans refuse to stop hostilities but stay clear of Athens and the surrounding area until the disease is under control. They focus their attention on other targets but do not fare as well as they hoped. At the beginning of the Second Peloponnesian War, Sparta and its allies believed their victory over the Dalian League would be swift, yet the war continues. In 429 BCE, the plague still consumes Athens. However, their naval forces continue to dominate the seas and punish members of the Peloponnesian League. Athens campaigns heavily in the Corinthian Gulf with great success. While this is happening, Sparta and its allies siege Plataea. The Second Peloponnesian War sees many sieges, and it's for this reason that more brutal tactics are developed to infiltrate enemy walls. Plataea is a prime example of the ruthlessness both sides resort to in order to break a city during a war. Spartan troops encircle Plataea and set up a blockade to ensure that reinforcements and supplies cannot reach the city. An earth ramp is constructed to allow Peloponnesian League soldiers to climb over walls. However, as the Plataeans watch the ramp grow higher and higher, they counteract the enemy's maneuvers by building up their walls. The Peloponnesians switch tactics and use brute force to try to enter the city. Battering rams are slammed against the walls and the gates. The Plataeans drop anything they can find from atop the walls to maim or kill the siege units below. Rocks and heavy beams and chains fall from the sky, pushing Peloponnesian forces back after every attempt to get close to the walls. The inability to breach the walls causes the Peloponnesians to utilize another main siege tactic. Their troops fall back and begin constructing a wooden wall of their own around the perimeter of the city. If they can't breach Plataea, they'll starve its citizens and force them to surrender. The Peloponnesians sit back and wait until the Plataeans are ready to submit. In 427 BCE, after months of starvation, the day finally comes when Plataea falls to Sparta and their allies. These tactics are used throughout Greece, and it's estimated that around 100 cities are sieged during the Second Peloponnesian War. Whenever a city falls, its inhabitants are either slaughtered or enslaved by the victors. 
In 428 BCE, Sparta attacks the island state of Lesbos, an important tribute city to Athens that's in revolt. But the Athenians are one step ahead. They send ships and troops to Lesbos to secure the administrative center of Mytilene. Once the Athenians arrive, they are ordered to slaughter the men of Mytilene and enslave anyone who remains. However, with Spartan forces approaching fast, it's decided that only the leaders of the revolt should be put to death. The Delian League manages to hold Mytilene and most of Lesbos while pushing the Spartans back to mainland Greece. The plague ends in Athens between 427 and 425 BCE, but the population has been ravaged. Between 25 and 35 percent of Athenians, or around 75,000 to 100,000 people, die as a result of the plague. This includes the great military leader Pericles. Sparta continues to launch campaigns into Attica and the areas around Athens, but makes slow progress due to the nature of siege warfare. During this time, Athenian ships continue their hit-and-run tactics along the Peloponnesian-controlled coast. In 424, Athens and the Delian League go on the offensive. It's decided they'll attack the Sicilian city of Syracuse while simultaneously campaigning in western Greece. Athens' superior navy moves around the region much quicker and more efficiently than the land-based Peloponnesian forces. The war takes a turn, and now it seems as if the Dalian League has the advantage. Sparta begins to panic. They try to consolidate their losses and begin talks with Athens to forge a new peace treaty. But the Athenians are reveling in their victories. They're not interested in Sparta's peace talks. The Spartan hero Brasidas manages to win an important victory in Chalcidice, which then leads to other towns and villages in the region revolting against the Dalian League. Brasidas meets the Athenian leader Cleon at Amphipolis in 422, where both military strategists are killed. Nicias takes over the leadership role of Cleon and persuades Athens to accept Sparta's peace treaty. In 421 BCE, a truce called the Peace of Nicias between the Peloponnesian League and the Dalian League is agreed upon. The contract is for 50 years of peace, along with some territorial concessions from both sides. The goal is to return Greece to the status quo just before the fighting broke out. Unfortunately, not everyone is happy with the agreement, and several commanders refuse to cede their captured territory to the other side. Mantinaia, Argos, Aelis, Corinth, and the Chalcidians form their own alliance. While Sparta secures an agreement with Boeotia, Athens' new leader Alcibiades forges an alliance between Athens, Argos, Aelis, and Mantinaia. Every decision made during the so-called Peace of Nicias is done to strengthen each side's position. Both the Peloponnesian League and the Dalian League know the peace won't last and are strategically forming alliances for when the next series of battles inevitably erupts. The fighting stops for only six of the planned 50 years. Between 421 and 415, not only are alliances forged, but small skirmishes start to occur. Fights break out across Greece, signaling the beginning of the second phase of the war. Spartan soldiers have just returned home from campaigning with Thrace when an uprising in Argos begins. The Spartans launch an attack against the revolters in 418 led by Aegis II. They defeat Argos and its allies. In the fallout, Spartan soldiers kill off the population of entire towns and villages for trying to stand up to their might. Athens carries out similar atrocities at Milos, who supported Sparta during the previous decades. In 415 BCE, Athens lights the match that sparks the war when they set off to invade Syracuse on the Isle of Sicily once again. This is no ordinary invasion. Athens amasses a force of over 100 triremes, 6,000 hoplites, and 1,200 cavalry. They are going all in on the campaign, and if they don't succeed, it will deal a fatal blow to their ability to win a war. The Athenian general Alcibiades leads the expedition. Athens needs to control Sicily to replenish its fleet. The timber on the island will be enough to substantially grow the number of ships it has, and perhaps even overwhelm the Peloponnesian League by dominating the waters around Greece. The city of Sigesta asks Athens for protection from the increasingly aggressive armies of Syracuse, while Alcibiades uses that as a pretext to launch its massive military force across nearly 350 miles or 560 kilometers of Ionian seas. However, the night before the Athenian military leaves, Alcibiades is accused of disrespecting the gods. These are likely just baseless accusations made by his enemies within the Athenian government, but it's enough to cause Alcibiades to flee. He finds refuge in Sparta, where he provides the Spartans with information about the campaign and the Athenian military. Athens launches its forces under the command of Nikias, who lays siege to the city of Syracuse. Fighting on Sicily and around its waters commence. The battle lasts for two years. However, in 413 BCE, the Spartans, led by Glypus, come to Syracuse's aid and break the blockade. They trap the Athenian ships in a nearby harbor and decimate their fleet. The Dalian League sends dozens more ships and thousands of men to reinforce their positions around Sicily, but it doesn't help. 
The Peloponnesian League's military led by Sparta defeats the Athenians, who are forced to retreat back to Greece. As Athenian forces try to return to friendly territory, they're hunted down and destroyed by the Peloponnesian warships. Nicias is captured and executed. Around 30,000 Athenian soldiers are killed, nearly two-thirds of the Athenian navy is destroyed. However, even after the massive defeat in Sicily and the catastrophic losses sustained by its navy, Athens continues to fight. They launch a series of raids along the Peloponnese coast. Alcibiades continues to advise Sparta. His expertise on daily and league military tactics and the vulnerabilities of Athens makes him invaluable to the Spartans. He recommends that a fort at Decalia be built to disrupt the food and supplies entering the city. When King Aegis II of Sparta moves forces to Decalia and makes it his headquarters, Dalian League city-states start jumping ship to join the Peloponnesian League, most notably Chios and Miletos. It's around this time that Sparta makes a surprising decision to seek an alliance with their former enemy Persia. In 412 BCE, a formal alliance between Sparta and Persia commences. Persia sends money to Sparta that allows them to build a fleet that can crush the remainder of Athens' ships. Even though the Dalian League suffered substantial losses in Sicily, Athenian vessels still operate in the water around Greece. All Persia asks in return for their aid is that Sparta recognize their sovereignty over all of Asia Minor. In order to rebuild the ships that they lost and replenish their numbers, Athens demands more and more tribute from the other cities in the Dalian League. This causes several factions to seek a way to escape the influence of Athens. Rhodes rebels and changes their allegiance to Sparta. Revolts break out across the Dalian League. The Athenian leadership is in turmoil, democracy in Athens is overthrown, and an authoritarian regime takes control of the city, but it's quickly removed from power by a more moderate group known as the 5000. By 411, the Athenian navy is almost back to its former numbers. They've been wreaking havoc all along the Peloponnese coastline once again. The Athenian and Spartan fleets meet in the waters around Greece. Both sides suffer losses. In 408, Lysander becomes the admiral of the Spartan navy. He is out to prove his mettle against the Athenians. By 405 BCE, Sparta has built a massive fleet using the funds given to them by Persia. It consists of approximately 200 triremes with state-of-the-art weapons. Lysander maneuvers his ships to meet the Athenians in the water around Egospotami. A maritime battle breaks out and 170 Athenian ships are captured or destroyed. The Spartans capture 3,000 Athenian soldiers and execute them all. This devastating defeat results in Athens losing the men and resources needed to rebuild its fleets and armies. They're forced to surrender and the Dalian League is disbanded. Athens is in no position to sue for peace. Instead, it must give in to every Spartan demand. The long walls are torn down, Athens is prohibited from building its navy to more than 12 ships, and they must pay tribute to Sparta. Sparta is now the dominant power in the region. They have defeated the Dalian League led by Athens and will control the majority of Greece for decades to come. However, Sparta's desire to expand its territory and dominate northern Greece as well as Asia Minor leads to a conflict with Thebes. In 371 BCE, Sparta suffers a catastrophic loss at the Battle of Leuctra. The Spartan army never recovers from this defeat and Thebes begins to annex more and more territory from the once mighty Spartan Empire. This event signifies the beginning of the end for Sparta. Now watch actual reason why Spartan Empire went extinct, or check out the real story of the 300 Battle of Thermopylae.